beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. sent from God, whose name was John. 
He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God.
the power to become children of God. For me, that's what resonates, I think, the most about the gospel message. I know that there's a lot to it. I think that's funny, too, that the gospel just sounds so simple. You know, just preach the gospel, the simple, the old-time religion, the gospel. But the gospel means so many things. It means something different to each person because each person is met by God where they are, and that's so beautiful. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. I think that there's a lot to be said about this in in our world today. Uh, Maybe it's the expectation was not appropriate for what and who Jesus would be. The the king, the Messiah, there's so much uh, baggage is, is a bad Uh, negative term, but, you know, there's a lot associated with those words. There was expectation that uh, God's anointed one, chosen one, would come and and rescue them from oppression, would set them free, just as God had done in the past. But God continually reminds us throughout the scriptures that God is doing a new thing, and a new thing, and yet a, a new thing. Sometimes it's through one person, sometimes it's through a whole nation. We see that God births a whole nation, the nation of Israel, to be God's son in a sense. And so Jesus, when Jesus comes, is the fulfillment of all of these expectations, but not just one expectation, and maybe not in the way it was expected. The fulfillment, we see this especially in Matthew, but even in John and the rest of the Gospels, and in Paul and uh, we see them hearkening back to uh, the, the Old Testament as we view it, to the prophets, to what is this Messiah going to be? And when Jesus comes, Jesus is all of these things and none of these things because Jesus is surprising. Jesus is humble and gentle and full of life and light and comes in the form of a child. We love our origin stories here in America, and this is kind of the origin story of Jesus. It's a new beginning, um, a time to reinvent uh, those expectations. And so when we find Jesus born in a manger, there wasn't even room in the inn for his family. That is not what we expected of a king. And that when he came, he was not accepted by those he came for. And there's a whole lot of baggage with that, too, that we've had to deal with through history. Uh, A lot of bad things have come um, from people that didn't understand that God's message is for all, including those who came and might have rejected Because after that it follows, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. A new start, a fresh beginning. As I hold my two-month-old daughter in my arms, I realize how perfect she is, but how hopelessly helpless she is. She is just beginning this thing called life. And when we begin to be children of God, may we give ourselves grace to start over. And as we bring others into the kingdom of God, to realize that they too are children of the divine one. It's a fresh start. God forgives, God gives grace, and God loves us for who we are. Because of that and for so many other reasons, we give praise. As we enter into worship, we're reminded of the goodness of God, of God's love for us. 
Sometimes language and semantics doesn't get there all the way. We say glory to God in the highest. What is the highest? It is above. It is beyond. For God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And yet God still dwells with us here. God sends his spirit to dwell with us, to show us that as we are children of God, he will lead us on and protect us. Glory. 
As we come to the lighting of the candle of love on this fourth week of Advent, Matt and I will be leading the liturgy for it and invite you to join. In a world where so many experience hatred, God lights a candle of love in our hearts as we wait for a savior, who will be Emmanuel, Christ the Lord. Hear the call of love from the Lord as he answers this question. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This Advent, we seek a spirit of love in all that we say and do. We light this fourth candle of Advent, as a symbol of the love that is found in Jesus. May the light and fire from this candle burn away everything that is preventing God's love from being born among us. May May we be not not afraid, afraid, for for God's God's love love is overwhelming the the world. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory And the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. As Matt offered a reflection earlier, I was reminded as you brought up Felicity um, that this particular text in John talks about how we became embodied. If we go back to the story in Genesis, it said God spoke things into being. Words create. Words destroy. Christ embodied the word. There's never been a word spoken that Christ did not know because we are told that Christ was also at the very beginning. And so if we look at the way that Christ lived, and we are reminded on this fourth week of Advent, the week of love, that we are to love one another, that we are to love God, and that somehow loving God and loving others as ourselves hangs all the law and prophets, then I can't help but to think that we shape the world around us with the very words we speak. I can imagine that Felicity is shaped by music as her dad sings, potentially, around the house. I can imagine Felicity will be quite the young theologian, being a PK two times over. And I'm reminded of my own kids. Julian is speaking 
faster than I can keep up with his vocabulary and his words shape our day to day. What word is he trying to say? Can you point to it as you say it? I'm trying to decipher toddlerism. And my world is shaped by his words. Words matter. Christ came to be because Mary said yes. How might we go out into our worlds, whether that's at work, family, home, friends, out as we run errands? How might we change how we live through the very words we speak? How might we realize that the very words we hear shape how we see ourselves, how we see the world? Words create and words can destroy. On the very words of Christ, that is all we have. We trust that he lived as such and that they're not just words. But this far from the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, and this far from the New Testament, all we have are words. We believe in them. We trust them. We cling to them. They can give us hope, peace, joy, and love. And they can also frighten us, disturb us. And as Matt noted, Sometimes the very words that we find comforting have caused harm to others because they didn't believe that love was enough. And so they yielded the words of Scripture as weapons. And we have the chance to yield them as medicine. We are embodied. We are told we are made in the image of God. So this very flesh and bones, and breath. Our awkwardness, our uniqueness, our tastes, our smells, are all part of God. And so my hope for all of us as we leave this service and go into the week before Christmas, that we embody love, that we do all we can to strengthen the world through love. Words matter. We are told that the very word became flesh. We live in that legacy of word becoming flesh. I hope in the next week, months, year, lifetime, that we believe these words so much so that they transform how we live, how we think, how we act, how we vote, how we engage. May we continue the embodiment of word. May we continue the embodiment of love. Amen. Spring of a 
the God and see, hail the incarnate deity. Please, as man with us to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of and life to all he brings risen with healing in his wings mild he lays his glory by born that we no more may die born to raise us from the earth born to give a second birth May you feel empowered to be the embodiment of Christ. For he sent his spirit to dwell within us that we might be his hands and feet in the world. You are a child of God. You are loved. You are special. And it is through your awkwardness, your uniqueness, that will bring forth God's glory here on earth. May you go and do so. Amen.